In this training video, I will be walking you through the audit configuration settings for Compliance Manager. We will cover instance level audit settings such as privileged users, database audit settings including before and after data, sensitive columns, and trusted users. The goal is to capture all the information required for your external auditors, internal auditors, and or your own internal IT needs while excluding all other events or activities. If you are required to adhere to specific regulatory guidelines, please consult with your auditors to ensure that the information you are capturing meets the regulatory guidelines. Compliance Manager captures event information at two levels. The instance level, where events such as creating new logins, granting role permissions, or creating new databases occur. And at the database level, where specific audit settings can be configured for each database. We'll start with the instance level settings first. Right click on the server or the instance and then check properties. We'll go to audited activities. Now these are the audited activities for their entire SQL server. So any accounts that do any one of these things that we check here is going to get captured. I'm going to talk about each of these and why we may or may not enable something. To start off with, we have logins. Now you have to be careful with logins because it's not necessarily one-to-one -one relationship with an application with login events to your SQL Server. For example, if you have an application that every time you do an activity, it creates a new session, does that query, whether it's an update, retrieve information, and then closes that session, you could see hundreds of logins for an individual a day. So when we do logins, typically I like to do this specifically for my privileged users. So those are going to be my DBAs. The next thing we have here are my failed logins. Now it's always a good idea to capture those failed logins. It could be something as simple as I've mistyped in my password. It could be something where I've uh, updated a service account and now it's unable to successfully log into the SQL Server. Or worst case scenario, somebody's trying to hack into the system. So again, it's always a good idea to track those failed logins. I could enable security changes here and as well as database definition changes, but those are really things that would be done by my uh, DB, DBAs or potentially my developers. So I'm going to enable that under privilege user auditing that we'll get to next. Administrative activities. Those are things like backing up your database, running a DBCC, uh, check DB, uh, maybe rebuilding an index, things that are truly administration or administrative and function against my SQL Server instance. For auditing purposes, we typically don't need to capture that. For internal IT needs, we may. And again, if we do that, we'll do that for our specific DBAs. Um, that way, we don't capture just generally scheduled backups. And then we do have user-defined events. Now, a user-defined event is not something that we create within Compliance Manager. It's actually, you can write T-SQL code to generate what's called a user-defined SQL Server event. It has a unique event ID, and if you are using code to generate some of that, we can capture it. And then lastly, we do have this access check filter. Now, when a user does an activity, the first thing that happens is SQL Server verifies whether or not they're allowed to do it. For example, let's say Chris is, has read-only permissions on a database and he's trying to do an update. With this check filter here, we're simply not going to capture the activity because when he tried to do it, SQL Server told him no access denied. However, in cases where you do actually want to capture if somebody tried to do something and they weren't allowed to, if you uncheck this, we do have something called a permissions denied report and you can capture that activity. Talking with most auditors that I've worked with and my customers have worked with, typically they only are looking for what a user actually did, not what they weren't allowed to do. Next we have privilege user auditing. The first step here is to select who your DBAs are. Now, a privileged user is a user with elevated access. This would be people like DBAs, uh, possibly developers, and we want to track what they're doing at the instance level. Now, when you first click Add, you'll notice the default is to look by server role. 
And I have customers that often come down here and say, see systems administrators and think that's exactly what they want to track. But the real answer is that we only want to track our human users. And if you select to capture system administrators, we could also get service accounts and other things that are going on internally that we simply don't want to audit. So my recommendation is to do, use the drop down, go to my server logins, and then select the appropriate DBAs or developer groups or individuals. In this case, I'm going to select my domain group called DBAs, and I'll even go ahead and add myself explicitly as well. Now I can choose which particular events or activities that I'm going to capture. Because typically DBAs and developers do not use an application, there's a little bit more of a one-to-one -one login to each individual server they touch. And because they do have the elevated access, I've chosen to capture their logins just so I can track which servers they're looking at. Failed logins, as I talked about before, it's always a great idea to track failed logins. And security changes. That's probably why we're auditing our DBAs in the first place. We want to capture whatever accounts they're creating, what additional privileges they're granting or even revoking, and we're going to capture all those security type changes. Administrative actions, again, that's things like backing up the database from an internal IT need. If I want to go ahead and track that, I can select it. Typically, auditors just don't care that happened. Database definitions. This is going to be anything to do with the change of uh, the schema, whether it's creating a new index, creating a new database, uh, updating a table, whatever it is, I'm going to capture that information. Now, if you're doing something like SOX auditing, that's definitely something that you want to have enabled. Some of the other auditor requirements uh, don't necessarily need that. Again, you'll have to verify with your, with your auditor to find out whether or not they want you to capture that information. I can also track database modifications. This is going to be insert updates and deletes. Now, if I check that here, any database that either one of my DBAs or myself modify, or I should say updates the data for, is going to get captured. And that would include other databases other than what I've explicitly have selected here. So it's up to you on whether or not you want to track everything that your DBAs are doing or whether or not there's just some specific things. Now in my case because I do have my database specific auditing I'm going to go ahead and uncheck that. That way if they were doing something in another database that really we don't need to audit I'm not worried about capturing that information. The same thing would be true for selects. If I turn this on any select they run I'm gonna capture but I'm gonna be very specific on what type of select operations I capture and I'll show you how we do that at the database level again I could also capture those user defined events uh, again those events that you that you create using T SQL code uh, I've chosen not to do that and because I am capturing database definitions, I can also choose, if I want to, to enable capturing the SQL statements. Again, it's up to you on whether or not you need to capture that information. A lot of times when it does come to, to the DDL type events, uh, we do go ahead and capture that. From an auditing perspective, I've had customers tell me that, yes, their auditors want it. No, their auditors don't want it. And it doesn't really depend on which um, regulatory guideline they're trying to adhere to. So again, you'll have to make a determination or verify with your auditor whether or not you want to capture that kind of information. Now that we've completed the instance level audit settings, go ahead and click OK. And then let's start with the database specific audit settings. I'll choose this database, right click and select properties, and then go to audit activities. And now let's cover the individual audit activities for this database. I could capture the database definition changes, but I'm already doing that for my DBAs or my privileged users. So I'm choosing to uncheck that. Security changes, while I am collecting that for my DBAs, maybe I have a DB owner that's not a DBA and they're not in the privileged user list, so I'm going to go ahead and leave that checked. Administrative activities, um, I don't care that it's been backed up, or certainly my auditor doesn't, so I'm going to uncheck it. Database modifications, these are going to be things like my insert, updates, and deletes. It's probably why I'm auditing this database in the first place. I'm going to go ahead and check that. Now with select operations, there's a lot of selects that go on all the time. And you'll know this if you've ever run a profile or trace. And because of that, I want to be very specific on the select information I capture. And we're going to define that under sensitive columns. So for now, I'll leave that unchecked. 
We also have that access check filter. And I could capture the SQL statements for DML and select activity if I want to. And then if I also want to capture the transaction status for the DML activity, that's things like begin transaction, uh, rollback or commit transaction, uh, things like that. If I really want to capture those individual things, I can select that. Again, auditors typically don't care about that. I'm going to leave it unchecked. The next tab we're going to talk about is DML select filters. Now this is where we can be very specific in what we're going to audit on that database, whether we're going to audit all the tables or maybe select tables as an example. What I'll do is I'll show you where I've done that specifically for the MSDB database. Now why would I audit the MSDB database? Well, I want to go ahead and capture any time anybody does an update to one of my SQL Server agent jobs. So I'm going to I'm going to audit that MSDB database because that's where everything is being um, recorded. That said, there's also a lot of other stuff in there that I don't want to capture. So I'll go to audit activities. I just want my DML in this case, and then I'm going to select DML select filters. And I want to be very specific on the tables that I'm going to capture, and I'm going to search on the sys job tables. And now I'll go ahead and add each one of those. So this is an example where I can be very specific on the tables that I'm going to audit versus everything on that entire database. I'll go ahead and click OK. And now let's go back to the original database we were working with. We just finished talking about DML select filters. Now let's talk about before and after data. When I enable capturing DML events, I'm going to capture insert updates and deletes, who did it, the time and date of course, and then what database and table that was affected. But I'm not going to make any records of what the values were or what they got changed to. In cases where data is very sensitive in nature and I do need to capture that information or it just very rarely changes and I want to make sure that I have uh, information in case I have to correct something, I can choose to select either by table or column information that I'm going to capture those values for. So I'll click on add, select the table, and by default it'll do all columns. But I want to just collect information for one specific column, so I'll click edit, say audited selected columns, and let's remove the ones I don't want, and for example I'll just leave salary. So now whenever the salary column is updated, not only will I have a record that Chris updated it, I will know what the original value was as well as what he changed it to. Now let's talk about sensitive columns. This works very much in the same way that before and after does. The difference is this is for select operations. I'm going to go ahead and select my employee table again, but this time Instead of anything, I just want to know whenever somebody's accessed that social security number. That would be considered sensitive information. So in this example, if I were to do a select first name, comma last name from employee, I'm simply not going to record that a select operation occurred. No sensitive information was, was accessed. However, if I do a select first name, comma last name, comma SSN from employee, now that sensitive information has been accessed and I'm going to have a record that somebody pulled or retrieved that information, specifically Chris at this certain day and time. The next setting is trusted users. Now what is a trusted user? It's a user we trust and that we're simply not going to audit what they do on this database. And the only kind of users that we trust would be user accounts that are actually not users or human users, but service accounts. I'll go ahead and click Add. I'm going to check server logins. And in this case, I do have a domain group called IDERA Services. And I've got a number of service accounts in there. Now when any of my service accounts does anything on this database, I'm simply not going to record that activity. This will really help eliminate a lot of that extra activity or noise as my customers call it in the reports because it's activity done by service accounts. And again, auditors are really only interested in what the human users are doing, not what non-human users are doing. And finally, we have our last tab, which is privilege user auditing.
Now in cases where maybe you have a user that's not a DBA or a developer, so they're not a privileged user, however, maybe they're a DB owner or they do things special on this database that other users don't. And for that reason, we need to audit them a little differently. So what I can do is click on Add, select the account, And then from here, again, I can define what audited activities I'm going to capture in addition to the regular database audit settings for this individual. So if you remember what I had at the database level looks something similar like this, where I was capturing security changes and database modifications. Maybe for this particular user, uh, they don't use the application. They are using something that allows them to run selects or other things. And for whatever reason, I've chosen that I need to capture that information for that user. So in this example, I'll capture their selects. Maybe I also want to capture their um, schema changes or the DDL. And now for this individual user, I'm capturing their information a little bit differently than everybody else. Again, in which way we can be very specific on how we audit the information. And I'll go ahead and click OK. The last thing you always want to do and get a habit of this. Now, we will automatically force the chain or send the updated audit settings down to that agent. But since we've been in here and we've taken the time to make those configuration changes, go ahead and just right click on the server and select to audit the uh, update the audit settings now and that will force the changes down. At this point we've completed all our audit settings and now we can go ahead and collect that information. Over the next few days you want to review the information you're capturing make sure it's everything you need and other stuff that you don't want to need. If you click on audit events you can see here's the specific events information that I've been capturing so far this looks good and I'm just going to monitor it over the next couple of days. I hope this video was helpful for you. If you have any questions, please reach out to your account managers or send an email to sales at idera.com and we'll be happy to help you out. Thank you for your time today.